Grand Central train station has a shocking little-known dark side. The latest crime novel from New York Times best-selling author Linda Fairstein, who's known for her meticulous research about New York, explores this in graphic detail. The novel's called Terminal City. Linda Fairstein, thanks so much for coming today. Wonderful to be here. So tell us what the book is about. The book is a, a crime novel, a murder mystery, uh, and I've been fascinated by the history of Grand Central Terminal. Um, went there first as a child growing up in the suburbs and watched it through its spectacular restoration uh, and always think of it as this very grand, massive place. The more research I did, the more of a dark history there really mm -hmm. is, including mm -hmm. sub-basements that were built so that they're not on any blueprints of the station at all, mm -hmm. so that no one could find them and know where they were. An example, when Hitler wanted to sabotage the United States train system, his plan was to get into Grand Central's basement and do that. Wow. Then there are the tunnels that literally extend for miles into Manhattan in almost every direction, and that's the city that was conceived more than 100 years ago to be part of the underground of Grand Central Terminal. Mm -hmm. And how about the people who live down there? The people who live beneath the station and actually in the tunnels that extend from it uh, were a side effect that nobody anticipated and nobody's very happy with. Mm -hmm. So there have been articles and books written about what are called the mole people, mm -hmm. people who have gone underground to live. Mm -hmm. um, very dangerous because of the train tracks, not only the traffic coming, but the electrified third rail. Yeah. And a walk through those tunnels um, is, is more shocking, I think, than anything I've seen in this city. My goodness. So Alex Cooper in the book is a fascinating character. She's very headstrong, which so you never quite know what she's going to do. And she's also very brave. How much of this character is, is she you? Is she part of you, what you wish you could be? <laughs> yes. I would say headstrong uh, and stubborn comes a lot from my own uh, personality. And she is much younger than I. Uh, but. I remember how I acted professionally as a young prosecutor. So she's emboldened more than I, and that's one of the better traits. The, the courage to do things um, is not mine at all. I mean, I had absolutely no physical courage. And of course, <laughs> I've taken great fictional liberties to put her in situations yes. that a prosecutor really, it, it's stretching things. She has her right. uh, two police detectives, Mike and Mercer, who she partners with and they cover her back and they don't ever intend to expose her. But of course the crime fiction readers love the jeopardy that the character gets into. So since I have no bravery for that kind of situation, it's great fun to imagine her in the recesses of, we've talked the underground station, but the, the station, the terminal itself is one of the most magnificent structures mm -hmm. in New York and it's massive. So there are hidden areas upstairs, there are operation rooms that the public never sees, there are the catwalks that people can see every day. Which you use to great effect. Well, that In terrified the, me. Yes, uh, you know, to it get terrified up on me a, to read it. <laughs> to get up on a catwalk and they're entirely glass enclosed, but then you look down and it's glass brick. And for me, I, I couldn't, I was paralyzed. I could barely take steps across the catwalk because it was so terrifying. I can imagine, I can imagine. And are there any parts of her as a character that you don't like? I think she's a little reckless about uh, doing things. She's well-intentioned, but um, and will ignore a authority. Reckless. And she's become quite. I'm kind of shocked <laughs> at the way she talks back now to the district attorney. Really? Yes. And I found that when I left the office a good number of years ago, she began to be a little more liberated that way. Yes. Yes. No, that was very interesting. So your job um, for 26 years, you were the head of the Manhattan Sex Crimes Unit, the That's chief right. prosecutor there, and you are the leading legal expert on sex crimes. So how did all those years of that work inform your writing? I much prefer novels in which you come away a little smarter for having spent time mm -hmm, in the mm -hmm. books. Uh, so they're written to be entertainments, but they are really informed by the experience I had as a prosecutor. This is your 16th Alex Cooper novel? Yes, it, it is. Yes. yes, it is. And obviously you want to differentiate each story so that it feels like something new. Do you? How do you make each story different and yet still keep those elements that readers come back for that they, they know they want? That's a great question. I mean, I think that um, 
readers are smart and they want a freshness mm -hmm. to the book. And some of that is, uh, for me, exploring new procedural techniques in forensics. And so readers, like if they like these books, they, they like current forensics. That's part of it. Mm -hmm. The relationships between the characters have to evolve. Mm -hmm. uh, and for my readers, Mike Chapman, who's the detective. Who's funny. It, it He's funny. I love that loud. Yeah. Uh, and uh, says exactly with no filter what's on his mm -hmm. mind. And he's smart. Uh, college grad who's a military history buff. And yes. so... And he's warm, but he's not gushy. He's not warm. gushy. No. He doesn't like to show no. that he's warm. And so the, the relationship that has evolved over the years between Alex and Mike sort of goes a little bit deeper in, in this book when she gets into trouble. So who are your readers and do you write for them or do you write for yourself? I started out writing for myself because I didn't know if anybody would come to the table and read. Um, and as the series has grown, I love to hear from readers, hear what they want. And so I've got, always got my favorite readers in mind when Have I'm you? writing. I think I've got a very intelligent readership, may I say, mm -hmm. in large part because um, the law plays a big piece in this yes. and history and revealing so much about the city. Mm -hmm. And when you write a book, uh, what's your process? Do you keep hours nine till five? How does that work? Uh, it's never quite nine to five. Mm -hmm. I usually write uh, for as many hours as I can. Um, it's quite tiring mm -hmm. and the strain can be intense mm. just sitting looking at the words all day um, or else the brain fries yes. and um, I don't believe in the luxury of writer's block uh, so I usually try and work through it um, and I would say nine to three is a really good day and if I'm on a tear if I'm writing dialogue between Alex and Mike especially mm -hmm. That's sort of like putting myself on a bar stool and channeling Mike Chapman and, and talking. Those pages seem to come quickly, and the more active, action-driven last quarter of the book is usually faster for me. I say it's yes. like dragging a sled up the up. hill at the beginning and then plateauing for a while, and I love winding things up. I love getting yes. to the end of the story, and that Very moves. satisfying. Satisfying, and those are... Those are easier days at the yeah. computer. Do ideas just come to you or? Ideas come from sitting in a restaurant and overhearing a conversation, uh, reading a newspaper clipping from a crime in a small town in Iowa. Mm -hmm. uh, it, I'm not going to use that crime, but right. sometimes it's the motive yeah. from that crime yeah. or an interesting character mm -hmm. who's done something. And so character or, or emotion are your access points into a story sometimes. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I love to read obituaries of fascinating people of lives. There was a guy in his 90s who died a month ago and it was an obit in the New York Times and he was one of the Bletchley Park decoders and worked on breaking the Enigma system during World uh -huh. War II and just reading the details of his life and then what he went to do afterwards. I goes into my clippings yeah. file and I, I know I will draw from some characteristic in his life move forward these many years mm -hmm. to someone who does similar work. Mm -hmm. so. And so your years, your 26 years as a prosecutor, yes. you must have seen things that most of us can't even imagine. So how did you manage your emotional life at that time? Do you know, again, a good question. Um, for me, it was just, I, I, I wasn't aware of building a Chinese wall and, and how I did it, but it had to be done. I mean, you had to analyze the cases strictly to make sure that you didn't just like the person and want to believe that she'd identified pre-DNA right. the right guy. And yes, I think the emotion was put aside till I was with friends or family uh, and could talk about what the day had been. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why the intense camaraderie that I show between Alex and Mike and Mercer and Alex and her other colleagues, I mean, you, you were in a very small world mm. needing to understand how this violence impacts your victims and then impacts you. Mm. And did you ever um, get close to danger and, and what happened? Some of us had threats from time to time and the DA and the police department would always make sure you were escorted until they got to the bottom of it and oh. nothing like Alex Cooper. Well, it is tempting because people know that it's it, springing from yes. your experience. And I speak, the characters 
told first person, so it sounds like it Linda's does. speaking. Yes. And that, to people who know me, is uh, it's also why they think I had a trust fund. And they said, really? I never knew. <laughs> no I trust never fund. Knew there was no trust <laughs> fund, but I wanted to be able to move around a little bit, so right. I gave her that. Why do you think it is that people are so compelled by violent crime? Many of us who write in this genre spend a lot of time talking and thinking about that. I mean, these are people's, the worst things you would want to happen to mm -hmm. your loved ones. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's hard Horrendous. to understand. Um, people like the endings where the universe is ordered again and the moral nature is restored. restored. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a form of ordering our anxiety, you know, that the world can be just put back into order. Yes, but of course, to get it back in order, you're home alone, as so, you know, reading these things often into the night, and they can be scary. Yes, yes. So are you thinking about your next book? I'm always thinking about the next book, mm -hmm. uh, yes. Um, I, uh, I'm always thinking where Alex will go next, and um, looking for sort of landmark places in New York to use as, as the backdrop. I have a few in mind, but I haven't researched them yet. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm really thinking of doing something very, uh, for me, very different, which is having part of the book told through Mike Chapman's point of view. Oh, interesting. But you haven't decided yet? No, meeting, sitting down with my editor very shortly okay. over lunch to uh, uh, to see if that would be a good way that, to see if that up. would be a good way to go forward. So, yes. so maybe um, any readers watching can weigh in. They can let you know. I'd love what to they hear from them. Absolutely. That would be interesting. Absolutely. And in the meantime, we have Terminal City. Linda Fairstein, thanks so much for coming today. Tessa, thank you for this talk. Thanks.